I mean, there's a, there's a simple answer to the question uh, in one way, from my point of view, which is that there's plenty of evidence out there that when you ask people about things going wrong with their relationships, one of the top reasons they give is arguments over money. Yeah. Absolutely, and we know what the, the key stresses are on relationships, and money worries is one of those big key stresses. But it's what does that mean in the, in the internal workings of that relationship, in the couple dynamic? I think there's another side to it as well, which is that money isn't just money. Money, money stands for all sorts of things. One of the things that myself and a colleague at uh, University College of London did is we did this really big survey um, and we got 109,000 people who uh, told us through a questionnaire things about their emotional and psychological relationships with money. One of the things we were interested in is what did money stand for for them. And we, we were broadly able to divide people up into three kinds of groups. Um, one group was people who saw money primarily about security. It's about putting stuff away for a rainy day. It's about making sure you've got enough for your pension. There's another group, a very different group, for whom money was all about freedom. It's about the freedom to do whatever you want. The freedom actually to uh, tell your employer to go hang and uh, I, I don't have to care about whether I keep this job or not because actually I'm okay financially. A third group uh, saw money as primarily about power and status. Mm. Uh, you know, these are the ones who, who were very keen that people saw them in a flashy car or that mm. uh, they were able to get their way because they've got lots of money. Money also about love. Money mm. as the giving and receiving of, uh, mm. uh, of love, about generosity. I, I think if we're thinking about what does money do in relationships, mm. yes, money trouble can cause the stress, but actually the very different ways in which people see money mm. can, I think, be also a source of friction. No, absolutely. And, and I think what, what we found, I mean, we, we did this study called the Enduring Love Study, and it was about how couples sustain their long-term relationships. And people were mentioning, especially women were mentioning, argument, arguments about money were one of the biggest things that they disliked about their relationship. But what was interesting is once couples work together to resolve a financial problem, then their relationship seemed to be positively impacted from that kind of economic deficit in a way. And they had this idea of the relationship horizon where something would change later on, one partner would get a job, their financial situation would get better, and it was, you know, against all adversity, they were stronger. Mm. And I think that's, that's really interesting about how money worries mm. actually can be a positive thing when couples work together as mm. well. People often are in relationships with people who are quite different from them. Mm. Sometimes that's what's attracted them in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue is not, are you different? But mm. do you find ways of, of talking about it and negotiating your way through that, you know? so. If you've got someone who sees money as all about security and their partner sees money as all about freedom mm. uh, to do what they want, then that, you know, that in a sense is a recipe for lots of arguments and mm -hmm. lots of difficulty. Um, but like anything in a relationship, mm. it's, it, it's there to be negotiated through. And obviously, you know, that's usually gendered. <laughs> you, know, we, you know, we know the, the, the pay gap if we're looking at in terms of um, parenting households as well, yeah. Yeah. that it is more likely to be the woman, the mother who stays at yeah. home. Yeah. And then the disparity in income and quite often resentment that, you know, I used to have a good job and now I don't. Yeah. And so yeah. suddenly I am dependent on the income coming in from the, the primary breadwinner. That, I think, you know, that is difficult. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think this, there, there can be some quite toxic combinations. You know, so if you've got somebody for who, who sees money as mostly about power and status, and they're the one earning all the money in a relationship, you can see that, that being quite a, a toxic combination. Mm. I think. What was interesting for me as well was when people were talking about this, what they then say was, well, how do they rebalance the scales when, you know, when you've got such different in, difference in finances. Mm -hmm. One woman was actually talking about, well, she was withholding her intimacy. She was withholding the love that she could give because it was the only way of retaining the power she felt she hadn't got. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how money can be matched by something which isn't money. And it's, I, I think it's, it's not just about couple relationships. You know, if you, do, if you look at wider families, you know, after, often the, the death of a parent can be an occasion when that triggers all sorts of arguments between siblings about mm. money. Entangled in all of that is all sorts of stuff about, oh well, they always loved you more than me, and, and it becomes a proxy for that. Absolutely, and it turns the, the old adage, you know, money talks completely yeah. on its head. It, yeah. it speaks volumes, yes. and, and it, it, the volumes it speaks is about the emotional currency of yeah. money rather than the actual monetary value. If you think also when 
the times of year, post-Christmas, people have spent a lot of their money. And, and we know the divorce spike is yeah. post-Christmas, yeah. but that isn't so much money. That's about the intensity of the occasion, the huge cultural expectation that we're all going to spend all of our time together and it's going to be quality time, but it's enforced quality yeah. time, yeah. that we're used to not spending together. Yeah. Most families spend vast amounts of time apart yeah. and suddenly they're in this contained environment. So I'm not convinced it's entirely about we've spent all the money and we realise we haven't got any by the end of January. I do a lot of work around um, financial capability, financial education and so on. I think in that world one of the things that often gets easily forgotten is that yes of course uh, there tend to be less money troubles where people are able to, to manage them. But that is almost completely drowned out by the fundamental issue, which is when you've hardly got any money, that, uh, that is the, in itself the cause of the, uh, uh, problems. And I think that one of the things that I suspect is really important is that in relationships where you're, you're really only just managing day by day or really struggling to manage or not managing, um, that the money becomes a focus mm. uh, of those difficulties and those stresses in a, in a, ways that it, a way it doesn't otherwise. Mm. But it, it also gets tangled up with all of the other stuff. Wanting to do the best for your kids if you've got children and just not being able to meet the ideal that we have as the cultural norm, which is the generosity of parenthood. Yeah. But I mean, what was interesting about the study, the qualitative study we did, yeah. was that people were saying that the emotional value, the, the couple relationship value of small gestures yeah. and they were very um, dismissive of grand gestures so forget the big you know interflora bouquet yeah. it was the very small flower that was picked from a you know a garden and, and I think that's where money is, you know you can really see that it, it isn't the problem yes I completely agree if you've got none actually it's just hard work when yeah. you're having to think about how can you feed yeah. your yeah. family yeah. but yeah. it isn't money per se is the dynamic of the yeah. couple which is the problem I think that not only is money inherently very emotional mm. how you manage your emotions makes a real difference to how effective you are financially you know for example we, one study we've just completed shows that people who are bad at managing their emotions will often find other ways of doing it well we know also you know that people do do things like comfort eating and uh, turn to drink or, or drugs or but one of the things that people also do is turn to things like buying buying impulsively you know and, um, you know paradoxically people in money difficulties will often cheer themselves up by going out shopping we know that people who understand their own emotions and other people's emotions are um, are actually better at hand handling their finances. Mm. What was interesting for me is the way that people were talking about their relationship. So we had one couple, for example, who would talk in a very clear-sighted way about, it's like having money, but you have to put affect, you, you put your emotional wealth together, you, you put your energy into a relationship. And then when times are really hard, when things are lean, emotionally, you can draw on that, you can draw on all of that. So I think people are making very sophisticated associations between money and um, economic value of things. But there's also a burden of social expectation that people are, are dealing with and they're constantly being flooded with actually very clever emotionally manipulative advertisements for example about you know to have a happy life you've got to have this or you've got to have that. I mean I think that's true but I mean if we think of some of the other adverts where it's just about this cultural expectation of everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to be great and what was interesting in our research project the Enduring Love project was that people were saying all media representations are rubbish yeah. we don't relate to them at all we just have no affinity with these because these aren't real people. What we do on an everyday basis is we just get on with life, we muddle on. Yeah. And what works in a relationship isn't those things that can be identified in the cultural sense. What works in a relationship are those things that only that couple know, for example. So the very, very small gesture. And I think that's what's different about the, the media. It's sort of, it's out there but it doesn't, in a way, impact on the personal relationships in the way we might think it does. Yeah. So I'm not sure about the advert. Well, there's lots of evidence they're quite successful in getting people to buy stuff. You know, this, this idea that, we, that came up in our, our research of you know, people equating money with love. You know, mm -hmm. that if you're not able to spend money on your, on your family, on the people in relations with, somehow you don't love them enough. Mm -hmm. I do worry about 
um, the way in which as a society we seem to be constructing our expectations of the role money should play in a relationship. Where I and colleagues started with all of this, we weren't studying emotions at all. We were studying, or well, certainly not relationships, we were studying the risk-taking behaviour of uh, traders in uh, investment banks. And what staggered me was just how much time these traders spent talking about their emotions and the emotions of managing these very large sums of money. You know, so this, this idea, so I think, you know, you studying relationships, myself studying uh, the way in pe which people, professionals and ordinary people behave in relation to money, have, have from, come from different directions to this idea of just how important emotions are in all of it. Yes, no, absolutely. And, and the cultural value that is assigned to emotional value. Yeah. So, definitely. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we were supposed to. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs>